Welcome to Crimepedia Podcast. This week, I am your host. I'm Cherry. And with me is, as always, my favorite person. It's the lovely Morgan. Hello. (laughs) Cherry, hello. (laughs) That was quite weird. (laughs) You look like a a masked invader then. All right, let me try this again. Hello, Cherry. (laughs) Much better. Hello. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. (laughs) <laughs> oh dear what a week in the week that we've got a new variant of coronavirus and what else has happened frank williams has passed away this week like formula one legend formula one legend frank williams owner, uh, like okay. founder and owner of the williams team passed away as well oh okay yeah yeah yeah. sad news sad news oh we've that got a sad. new we've got a new baby in the crimepedia do. squad our friend um jason over at santa maybe the criminal podcast He's had a little baby, Lucas Elliot the Elf, has been delivered in, the, yeah. almost was delivered in the sleigh, but actually made it almost. to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so congratulations. congratulations. So cute. Really, really exciting yeah. news that was for us this week. So congratulations. And Cherry, we have a new Patreon. We do. Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us. We are very, very, very honored to have you on board. Thank you. I think Jocelyn's represented Canada, so thank you for she is. for that, Jocelyn. Yep, and thank you to everyone who's been leaving us reviews. We've been happy dancing. We love your reviews. Love listening to what you think about the show. And thanks to everyone. We've had a few case suggestions this week, which has been really good. We did. So um, yeah. I've got those on the list. I've got a British one. I think we've got an American one. And I've got another Irish one as well, which is quite good. So oh, um, good. thanks. We keep adding those to the list. Um, thank you very much for all of that. And also reminder of your CrimeCon tickets. We've got CrimeCon UK next year in June. We've also got CrimeCon USA in Vegas next year as well in April. So you can use our same code for either one. So if you want to get yourself tickets, just use the code Crimepedia at checkout and it'll get you 10% off of your ticket price. Yeah, you are going to need that little bit of a, that little discount. <laughs> yeah, you're going to need it. Because especially for Vegas, those hotel prices are getting up there. And also, if you think of it, 10% it, off of your ticket price means means you've got 10% more to spend on goodies. Mhm. 10% more in putting in those slot machines. <laughs> yeah, and also, we've got a little present for you. So if you do use our code, let us know because they're not allowed to provide us with the names of people that used our code. So if you did use the code, then let us know. We can tick you off the list and then we can give you a little yes. present in person when we see you because we're going to both be at both of the crime cons next year, which is super oh, exciting. It's so I won't be carrying exciting. around an, an iPad with you on it this year, uh, next year, and you won't be carrying <laughs> around an iPad with me on it next year. <laughs> yeah. Well, as long as Omicron chills out. Yeah. You know. oh, God, yeah. Let's let's just hope Omicron goes Omicron. away. Um, I think I've still got the picture I had of you. So I think what I'm going to do is I think I might just like raffle it off. And, and <laughs> I might do that because so many people asked me what I was doing yeah. with it after. So I was like, oh, I'm going to take it with me. But I think it's in the cupboard. So I might raffle it off for good cause somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. So this week's case was a case that I found whilst talking to a friend of mine, um, Mark Williams Thomas from the Detective um, Podcast. Um, This is one that came up, I think, through LinkedIn, actually. Um, And I've been looking into this case for a while. It's very, very interesting. So it's not one, I think, that we can do a lot to help solve. But hopefully, just with spreading the word on this one, the right ears might hear it and we might be able to to help in that way. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. This week's case is the murders of a guy called John Greenwood and his best friend, Gary Miller. Mm-hmm. 
in 1980, in Whiston, two best friends left home to go out and play. The 11-year-old boys were inseparable. They attended House of Junior School and were both members of the local scout group. The boys walked a short distance to a local rubbish tip. Their bodies were found a short time later. This is Crimepedia, and this is the murder of John Greenwood and Gary Miller. Okay, Morgan, so before I start this week's case, I just want to say that this is a case about the murder of two children. So there are some graphic details in this that it's not nice to hear, but I do think that it is imperative to the case that you understand the injuries. Okay, so just in case, if if that's something that you don't want to listen to, this might not be the case for you this week. So on Saturday, August 16th, 1980, before you and I were both born. No, no I was born. Oh, you were 81. Oh, yeah, you were born. No, I wasn't 79. born yet. You were 79. You're older than me. Uh, so yes, August 16th, <laughs> 1980, uh, around tea time, which is about 5 p.m. here, because I know you guys don't get the whole tea and dinner business. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, yep. 11-year-old John Greenwood, who lived with his mum, Barbara, father, John. He had an older brother called David and a younger sister called Deborah and a brother called Alan. He and his best friend, Gary Miller, also 11, left John's house to go out and play. Now, Gary lived with his mum, Alma, and his dad, and two older brothers, William and Ronnie, and a younger brother, Kenny. So these are like quite quite big families. They've all got siblings, but these two were absolutely inseparable. And John and Gary lived on a road called Raleigh Avenue in a place called Whiston. Now, Whiston is about eight miles from Liverpool. So it's on Merseyside, about eight miles from Liverpool. And After leaving their home, the boys walked across the car park of what was then called the Horseshoe Pub. They crossed a road called Windy Arbour Road and went behind Whiston Labour Club. Now, witnesses saw them heading towards the entrance of a rubbish tip through the hole in a fence. It was literally, when I've worked it out, it's about a five minute walk from their home or from, from his home to this rubbish tip. It's not very far at all. Now, this was the last time that the boys were seen. Now, around 9.30, when the boys hadn't returned home, their parents started to worry and all went out to look for them. So they knocked on doors of local, I mean, we're talking 1980. So this is when, I mean, when I was a kid, um, like 1986, 87, we used to play out in the street and you would know it was time to go home when the streetlights went on. So in the summer, you could be out until, you know, quite a bit later. So it wasn't unheard of of these boys not to be back by like seven, you know, half seven. So- At 7.38 p.m., a 999 call was received by the ambulance control room from a local man called Herbert Rush. This was then passed on to Whiston Ambulance Depot, and then an ambulance with two ambulance men was sent to this Pottery Lane. So Pottery Lane, which is where the local council tip is, so all the bin lorries and all the refuse um, collections would go there and would get dumped at, like, landfill. This now, this area now is known as Statmower's Park, I think I've said that right because the spelling of it is really strange, but I think that's how you say okay. it. Now, Herbert had been walking his dog and about 100 yards away from him in like a small hollow at the tip, he saw a guy up on like on the rubbish and it looked like he was beating something in the ground. And he looked at this guy and thought, like, this is really weird. What is that guy doing? Like, it's odd. So he sort yeah. of like walked his dog around but kept an eye on this guy. Now, when the guy walked away... Herbert went up the up the tip to investigate. Now, when he went up there, he found the boys. He got as he got closer to the spot where they were, he could hear like a groaning sound. And mm. he found like a, a disused mattress on the top of this like tip pile. As he yeah. pulled it over, he could see that the boys were underneath this mattress. Now they were on top of each other. John was lying face down in the ground and Gary was lying on top of him on his back facing upwards. Now they both had injuries to the backs of their head. They were, there was a lot of blood and they were having difficulty breathing. Now they were both alive. The ambulance was having difficulty getting to the tip because the gates were locked. So they had to wait for some policemen to arrive and and cut the padlock off and then once the padlock was cut off and the gates were open, the poli- the ambulance crew were able to get in and get to the boys. Now, okay. the police said that the boys were really well hidden underneath all this rubbish and underneath this mattress. And if if that guy Herbert hadn't have been walking when he was walking, 
they, they don't believe that they would have found the boys alive. Mm. So both boys were taken to Whiston Hospital at around 8 p.m. They were then transferred to Walton Hospital Neurological Block. Let me ask you one question real quick. Mm -hmm. I I might have missed this. How long was it between the time that um, that the gentleman saw the guy beating something and Mm -hmm. him calling for the ambulance? He 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 watched him walk. It wasn't it wasn't very, very long. So he saw him beating something and then he waited for a bit. So we're talking minutes. And then the guy walked away. And then when he was out of sight, he then went up found the boys okay. and then ran to a local house because obviously there was no cell phone so, then, rang to a local house and called the police and the ambulance. So long enough for whoever was was up there to to hide the bodies. Yeah. Or bury well, them. Well, I, th- I think by the, by the sounds of things, by their injuries, he could well have been witnessing them being murdered at the time. At the time, be, yeah. Being that's beaten at okay. the time, yeah. So he could yeah. well have, have witnessed them being beaten. Okay. So... The police um, then obviously got the kids straight to the hospital and they were sent by separate ambulances from Western Hospital to Walton Hospital and they had separate medical teams working on them. Now, meanwhile, this was going on, despite looking around the local area and knocking on doors, there was obviously still no sign of the boys and the parents then called the police. Now, when they called the police, the police then told them that two boys that matched that description had been found and were on their way to Walton Hospital. So the parents are now thinking, oh, my God, what's happened? And off they go. Now, unfortunately, John died at 2.45 a.m. the next morning, and Gary died a few days later at 2.30 on the afternoon of the 20th of August. Now, post-mortems revealed that the boys had both died as a result of the head injuries. John had died from cerebral laceration and hemorrhage due to fractures of the skull. He also sustained external injuries to the head, face and neck with bruising on his scalp, lots and lots of bleeding, extensive bleeding to the back of the head and a bruised and swollen left eye. Now, his face, his eyeballs, his gums and the inside of his lips all had multiple pin sized like petechial hemorrhages, which suggests then asphyxiation. Gary also died from cerebral laceration and hemorrhages due to fractures of the skull. He also had various head injuries and the posterior of his skull was fractured and both frontal and temporal lobes were extensively bruised. There was also found that he had a layer of blood over the whole surface of his brain. So you can understand from this the extent of the injuries on these two boys. Quite violent. Very violent, like a really violent murder of two young children now in both cases the doctor said that the injuries to the back of the skull were more consistent with their heads being banged on the ground rather than something hitting them so rather than it being a weapon that did it the lacerations to the back of their head and the injuries to the skull at the back is consistent with heads being banged against the floor or banged against something and there was only one one person that was seen at the dump hmm Right? One person, yeah. So then my question is now. Yeah. How does one person manage to assault two victims in the same way? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Because you would have to, you, and, and when they were found, they weren't like tied up or anything. They were. No, no. Okay. Because you would think that if one is being attacked and they're he's banging their head against the ground, yeah, is is the other one inca- incapacitated or I, I couldn't imagine that they would just sit there and wait for their turn. No, I mean well, I, I don't know. What saying that's right. I'm not saying that to be to be funny. I'm just no, saying, no, no. I totally agree with you. That's right. They're not just going to sit there like sub unless they've been subdued in some way. They're not going to just sit there and uh, watch that happening without making a noise. You know. Mm-hmm. So this goes. You know what this reminds me of already in my yeah. head. It, yeah. The West Memphis Three, and it's I like, knew you were well, going to say were, that. Yeah. How were you able to to kill three boys mm. if? If it was just one person on Mm. your own. Mm. Well, I'll give you a little insight on how that might have happened in a bit. Now, there was no sign of any sexual sexual assault 
which is a relief as well, because I think this is bad enough without a sexual assault added to it. Now, the community was then in fear because this person was at large. There was no idea who this person was. And this is an attack on two children, which is horrific in itself. Now, Herbert was actually able to describe the man to the police, which is good. He said the man was between 20 and 35 with dark swept back hair, swept, swept back hair and was okay. described as Ronald Reagan style. Oh, okay. That kind of hair, okay? He was wearing a brown yeah. jacket, which sometimes in some some things I've read, it's described as a red jacket. So he was but but this is what um this is what Herbert says. It was a brown jacket and brown trousers, okay? So the police then were obviously determined to find this person. They actually sent around 100 officers brought into the investigation. They had police tracker dogs down there. They had literally everybody onto this because the local community, which was quite close knit, was disgusted that something like this could happen. And everybody was then in fear because they didn't want to let their kids out. Now, two days after the murders, police announced that they had made an arrest. A 20 year old man called John Cheeseman. Now, there's a lot of Johns in this. You've got John, yeah. you've also got John the victim. You've also got John's dad is called John. And then you've got the the actual guy who is charged with this murder. He's also called John. His dad's called John. So there's so many Johns in this. Okay. It gets quite confusing. <laughs> yeah. So, John Cheeseman is the person that was char- he was actually brought in and charged with the murders of John and Gary. Now, he lived on Hughes Avenue, which is less than a mile away from where the boys lived on Raleigh Avenue. So we're talking close. He He's known locally to people. People knew who he was. He lived with his parents, Eileen and John. They were a local family that other people knew. He was reminded in custody. And when I looked through this, there's not actually much known on the details of how he was linked to this case why he was brought in particularly. There's not a lot to say why he was chosen. Now, there was a stop, I understand, that was put on press releasing details at the time. So the Liverpool Echo was like the main newspaper that reported on this. I mean, it did go through the sun and it did go through like the mirror, but locally the Liverpool Echo was the newspaper that you would find out what was going on. He Mm -hmm. um, was then put to trial on in May 1981 at Liverpool Crown Court. The trial was presided over by Mr Justice Peter Taylor and John Cheeseman pleaded not guilty to the murders of both these boys. Now, Herbert Rush was called in to testify, testify against John and there were another 12 witnesses that testified that they had seen John Cheeseman in Whiston in the centre between 7 and 7.30 that evening. So he was within the vicinity of where the boys were seen. They all say that he was dressed the same way that Herbert Rush had described. The prosecution also had a very key piece of information. Now, two days after the murders, Chief Inspector Ernest Kelly from Merseyside CID interviewed John Cheeseman. He had been interviewed by police for quite a considerable time. And there are various accounts online back and forth of what was said and how it was said. So if I read through to you everything that different people reported on it would be very conflicting and we'd be here for quite some time so yeah what basically what happened is they interviewed him for quite a long time and finally it got to the point where he was happy to give a written statement however when he was asked to provide the written statement he told the police that he couldn't write so they contacted his father called his father to come in when his dad came into the room allegedly he told his dad and this is i quote it was me that done the two boys at the tip. The dad said, oh, no, I think that you're just being victimized. I I think that they're just trying to blame you for this. And apparently John stood up, grabbed him by the arm and said, yes, dad, I did. I did do it. I did do it. So then the dad was told that John wanted to make this statement and that it would be made in, in the father's presence. So he was happy with that because obviously he was there to see what the son was saying. Now about, so he wrote this this is this is i'm going to read you it as it says as his state his written statement so this is his written statement at about six o'clock on the day in question i went down to high i think i don't know how they say it is h-u-y-t-o-n so i don't know if that's heightened tip so forgive me if you're from the liverpool area and that's how you say it so he went down to the tip to look for some new bike parts when i got there i couldn't find none 
I came back and I seen John Greenwood. I knew John from Scouts. I saw him on the tip, so I went over to talk to him. He was with his mate. I don't know his mate. Some more boys came over and asked me, did I know where there were any bike parts? I said, I think I know where there is some. I went with them and there was none there when we got there. So we came back and they went away. There was only me, John and his mate there and they started to call me names, John and his mate. They started swearing at me and I started to hit them. They carried on calling me the F word and calling me names. So I started to hit them again. Then I thought one of them was dead. He wasn't breathing. So I listened to his heart. Then I got a piece of rope and put it around his neck. I thought the other one was dead. He wasn't breathing. He was unconscious. The rope I put around one of the lad's necks, I threw away near the railings. John's mate said I was knocking a married woman off. When I hit them, they fell on a mattress. When it was all over, I left the mattress there. It was near them. I hope the scout master master doesn't find out. When I left the boys, I climbed over the railings and went through a tunnel and then home. So that's that's his statement of what happened. So he mentions that one of the boys, he put a rope around their neck. Now, if you remember from the yeah. post-mortem, the post-mortem does say that one of the boys had the petechial breaks in the skin and in his eyes and in his mouth. So that correlates with that. Now, that wasn't, at the time, that wasn't publicized in the news. But, okay, was there anything, where, where was it? It was in his face, but was there anything, indication around the neck that he had been Well, frank- not that I could, it, it says that there's signs of it. He's got bruising, but it doesn't particularly say it's like a rope burn or anything like that. It just said that there was, the, the pathologist said that there was bruising to his face and there was these little okay. particular, like, pinpricks on his face. Okay. Okay, so now the defense pointed out that immediately after he gave this statement, he immediately recanted his confession. The defence argued that there was no traces of any fibres from the boys' clothes on the clothes that John was wearing that night. There was no evidence of any blood on John's clothes, despite the fact that this was quite a brutal, horrific, bloody scene. Another problem they encountered in the trial was that John Cheeseman's mental capacity was in question. The defence argued that this made him susceptible to suggestion and leading questions. Now, he had learning difficulties and was said to have the mental age of a 10-year-old. And so this was after he had an accident when he was a child, which left him with some damage to his brain. So he only had the mental capacity of a 10-year-old. And he, and he was said to have been a likable kind of guy that often associated with kids a lot younger than him that were in his mental age, basically. Mm-hmm. Now, the prosecutor, sorry, the defense say that there was no appropriate lawyer or guardian during those interviews and that the questioning was literally arduously long. It, there was no, not very many breaks for him to take. And it was just done, you know, not within the, not within the rules really. Um, let me, can I ask you, let me ask you another question real quick about mm-hmm. the investigation or what they found. Mm. Did they ever find the jacket that he was supposedly wearing the night that this happened. Well, it said that they took his clothes in. Apparently, we don't know what clothes he, took that in. he said he was wearing. That he, that he said he was wearing that day because obviously he's he said that he's done it, but then he's also said that he wasn't there and that he didn't do it. Was there? Do we know if there was any blood on any of the clothes? No, there's no nothing forensically on the clothes that they took of his. There's nothing forensically linking him to the boys. Because like, other... I'm th- still thinking about I'm still thinking about his his confession, right, mm-hmm. or what he said happened, mm-hmm. and there's already things that wrong with it, right? So the time's yeah. wrong. Yes, he's uh he's like an hour and forty minutes off with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, possibly the rope around one of the necks is possible. Now he yeah. says that he was hitting them. Yeah, but he doesn't say that he's hitting them with like any sort of like weapon or anything. So I'm assuming no, he just he, says he's he, hitting with them. The fist. Yeah. The other okay. thing, about the, it's interesting you mentioned the timing, because remember I said that there was those 12 witnesses that saw him in the town and said what time they saw him? Yes. Well, uh-huh. in the town centre, there's a clock that people usually would use to tell the time yeah. when they were in town. Now, the clock has got four faces. You can see it all the way around. Yes. All four faces 
so showed a different time. Oh. So depending on where you were looking, the time might not be right. Well, that's not a very different useful times. clock. <laughs> no. It really that's not useful at all. No, not useful at all. Now, also, the um, the rope that he talked about that he said he discarded, they did actually find it, and they did actually find it where he said it would be. Oh, okay, okay. So the trial lasted four days, but basically the failings by the police were, you know, blatantly obvious at trial and didn't make it look very uh. good. And the jury took 45 minutes to acquit him and found him not guilty of both murders. Wow. So the that's killer, for, obviously it. the fam. Yeah, 45 minutes. Because at the trial, there was a lot of stuff that didn't make sense, you see, that was presented to the jury because he had no evidence of anything on the clothes that they took from him that he said he was wearing that yeah. night. Um, obviously, they arrested him like two days later. So whether they had picked up the clothes that he actually was wearing that night or whether he had got rid of the clothes that he was wearing that night. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with um, the description from Herbert was that Herbert said it was a guy with black swept back hair, but he had like blonde shaggy hair at the time. So that didn't really mm -hmm. make sense either. Um, so, of course, that's something well, that the defense can use. You know, they're using the description of him. And obviously that then casts doubt, doesn't it? And then the the fact that the clock was wrong on all four sides, that then puts into doubt the 12 witnesses' statements because then you've got a little bit of reasonable doubt in there. There's nothing to link him forensically to the boys either. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, he what, does talk. What, go on. What, I was going to say, what time does it in August in, in England, what time does it start to get dark? Not till late. Yeah, not in, not so, in summertime. So the shunt, yeah. Well, because I'm thinking, I was like, uh, well, po is it possible that he saw th saw this guy and he was like in a shadow, so maybe his hair yeah, maybe darker than yeah. it was. Of course, that could it's explain possible, that. But um, to a jury, well, he, that casts doubt, doesn't it? That he's got blonde hair sitting in the dock, and this guy's said yeah. it's a black, you know, Ronald Reagan style hair. Yeah. Now I'm assuming that this this like this dump, as I would call it, is yeah. probably a place that that kids would play in. You know, you're not supposed to. Yeah, they would be in trouble. For yeah, you're not there. supposed to. Mm. But I would yeah. imagine this is somewhere that that it would be attractive to kids in the area. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What can you find because, in there? Is probably yeah. places, many places that you can hide in there. And I'm imagining yeah. that these dumps are like they're like mounds of yeah. rubbish. Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, because he said that he was there to find to look for bicycle parts. Is that yeah? That what he said. Okay, yep. and he said that there were some other boys there that mm -hmm. had approached him. Mm -hmm. Did could anyone anyone that had seen him that day may actually say, "Yeah, I saw him at this dump"? No, not that not that I know of. I couldn't find anything about these boys that were said to be there at the time about these boys having like having been interviewed or having said that they saw him at this time i couldn't find anything yeah. from about them at all because at this point i don't know what i think um, i know it's interesting isn't it because on one hand what would you be doing at the top and you've obviously been seen hitting something and then the guy's gone up there uh -huh. minutes after you've left to where you were hitting something and there's two boys there you then go and you, if it, in front of your if father, you go and talk about it. Well, yeah, that's yeah. right. We're He's then... okay. A, we're assuming that it, that was him on top, yeah. you know, doing this. Mm -hmm. But then also, if he has diminished intelligence, mm -hmm. it's also very easy for him to be manipulated by police. Yes. So even yes. when he's going back to his father and saying, yeah, I did it. Mm. Maybe he thought that was what he was supposed to do because once again, I'm going to go back yeah. to West Memphis three. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, and... Jesse Miss Kelly and mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, where he he you know he was the one that was giving all these stories, which made absolutely zero sense, and but they still mm -hmm. used it mm -hmm. in order to get a conviction. And the first person that I thought of when I always when I always hear about stuff like this is Brendan Dassey. You know, because oh, yeah. he mm -hmm. he obviously we could actually see that interview where the police yeah. coerced him into you know did you 
you know, what was, where was she, where were they burning stuff? Was it in this? No, it wasn't. It was this. It wasn't. Well, no, it was. It, oh, yeah, it was in that. And it's like, well, okay, the way that they spoke to him and the way that you can coerce young children, because this guy's got the mental capacity of a 10 year old, you can coerce them around to say in certain things and, and, and reciting things that you say to them. So to me, it do, it's not surprising that he came forward with all this information because yeah. we've got however many hours before the dad comes in of the police talking to this boy to put those, you know, to put those ideas into his head and give him those little nuggets that only the yeah. killer would know and only the people that found the boys would know. Well, yeah. So I'm looking through like some of the interview before he had a written conf confession where he's, yes. where they were asking him about the mattress. Yes. And he said that there wasn't a mattress. Yeah. And when they asked them, like, uh, why did you say there wasn't a mattress? And so he came back and said, because there wasn't. But eventually they got him to to say that there was. Yes, but it wasn't so it now, was near them. So now he knows. And OK, so now I know that there is a mattress involved in yeah. this somehow. Yeah. So that's why in his very confession, he said, oh, they fell down on the mattress. Yeah. He didn't say, oh, I covered them with a mattress. No, no. He, he just, just said he, they the fell mattress. down onto a mattress. But yeah. obviously, that mattress had been placed on top of the bodies. That's right. So that doesn't, you know, so that you can kind of piece together how this confession is coming about, really. Now, a new appeal yeah. was launched in October 2016 after Merseyside Police's serious crime review unit was given new information. So they got this new information. And the first part of this was that two boys are believed to have been attacked about a month before the two boys were killed. Now, witness came forward to say they had seen these two boys that they thought to be aged between 10 and 15 being attacked by an older man. And this was outside Whiston Health Centre. Now, secondly, another boy was believed to have run up a garden path in nearby Housenet Avenue calling for help a couple of weeks before the murders. Okay. Okay. Another witness came forward to say that there was a man seen with three young boys who were aged between 12 and 14. Now, they were near to the church hall on Dragon Lane, which is in Wisdom. And this was between 6.45 and 20 past seven on Saturday, August the 16th. Now, two of the boys that were seen with this man were stood on a wall of the church hall and one of them was in the church hall grounds. Now, police wanted to talk to anyone who knows about these boys, who maybe could be one of these boys, knows who that man was. Maybe they were the man that were talking to these boys. And they want to talk to anyone who was at House of Junior School with both the boys in 1980 or around that age or members of the 28th St. Helens Scout Group, which is like first Wiston has that, um, Scout Group. Now, they also mentioned in this case review that they would like to speak to a boy called Duffy or Cuffy thought to have been oh. with the boys shortly before they were murdered. Now, this could be somebody who was up on the dump talking to them and talking to um, the other guy, John Cheeseman. Now, he owned a yellow chopper push bike. Back then, now you would remember in your childhood if there was a local boy that you used to hang out with that had a yellow chopper push bike. Yeah. I remember back when I was a kid, I had a white BMX. And I remember my friends' bikes because all my friends had mountain bikes and I was the only one yes. with a fat, tired BMX bike. Yeah, yeah. So I can mm -hmm. remember which friends that I hang out with. I can remember still the colors of who the bikes that bike. they had yeah. and who had what bike. Yep. So you would yep. know if you went to the corner shop and everybody's bikes were lined up outside, you'd know whose bikes were who, wouldn't you? You're right. You'd remember that. Yeah. So yep. somebody must remember that they lived in that area at that time between like, you know, the ages of like 10 and 14 mm. and someone that sounded like Duffy or Cuffy had a yellow chopper push bike. Oh yeah. No, no, you know? absolutely. Especially with that type of name, Duffy or Cuffy. Well, exactly. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Could, Something like that. You Someone is going to remember that. I mean, 11 year olds, I've got quite good memory from my you know childhood days when I was that age. I can remember the kids I used to hang out with and where we used to go and what we used to do. So somebody's still got memories of this person. And oh, I think yeah. that yellow chopper push bike is quite significant. 
Huh. Inter- so, yeah, they the police believe that, obviously, those sightings, they believe that someone would remember seeing John and Gary that, you know, that day. And police yeah. issued, a pu- which is a good thing, they issued a public apology last May to John and Gary's families and said that the man that's been mentioned in these separate scenarios may be the same man. So we might be looking at the same man talking to all these different kids because you've got like they, he was seen with some like 10 and 15 year olds at the health center. Then another guy was talking with a man. Or sorry, another guy was talking with boys by the church hall. So it could be the same man who's talking to all of them. Now, Assistant Chief Constable Ian Critchley spoke with the Liverpool Echo and issued an appeal for those with information to come forward. He said that they've reviewed the case and have undertaken further investigation and are appealing for anyone who has any evidence that can help, however insignificant you think it might be. If you lived in that area at that time, you remember the boys, you remember like a boy with a yellow bike, then come forward and help to bring justice to John and Gary's family. So police also want to talk to John Cheeseman again as they believe that the new evidence that they've got, he might be able to help them with. They want to arrest him and re-interview him again, but unfortunately, this is now not possible due to the double jeopardy rules in the UK. So you okay. can't you can't convict somebody that's already been acquitted of a crime unless yeah. there is new, significant, compelling evidence. And it's not thought, unfortunately, it's not thought that the evidence that they've got, the new evidence they've got, is compelling enough and significant enough to be able to re-interview John Cheeseman. Hmm. So John and Gary's families have been campaigning, as well as the police, to change the law. Now, there is a petition that was filed by John's sister, Debbie, in which you can sign a petition to get this. They're working with an MP, they're working with the police to get the double jeopardy laws changed because I think this law has been in place for like 800 years or something ridiculous like that. And it's outdated. You know, a lot of the things that this double jeopardy law, basically it's to protect people from being harassed. It's to protect innocent yeah, people from to be, being harassed. Yeah, yeah. You you don't want to be in a thing. situation yeah you don't want to find you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're just constantly being yeah. brought in questioned charged mm. going yeah. to trial over and over and over and over and over that's right yeah and obviously he's been acquitted once in a court of law and so they're not able to do that unless they have something really concrete to bring to him then you know they can't now unfortunately John's mum Barbara who was 28 when her son was killed passed away earlier in November this month and so she will never personally see the person brought to justice but i would like to end on a good note There is some good news. Now, former police officer who's now investigative journalist, Mark Williams Thomas, our friend from the Detective Podcast, you might know him from Netflix series. Uh, He's got another podcast that he's just brought out with Nazir Afzal. It's got episode one out at the moment. He is working on this case and he has revealed that he's got some compelling new evidence, which he hopes he's going to be able to reveal for the families. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that is something very exciting for this case and hopefully for John and Gary's families that he might have uncovered something that might help this case significantly. Now, if you know of any information, if you've got any information on this, you can call Crime Stoppers. However insignificant, if you grew up in that time and you lived in that area or you know, you knew John and Gary um, and there's just mm-hmm. anything that you could just bring maybe that might just help this, um, you can contact, obviously, Liverpool, you can contact the local police or you can contact Crime Stoppers. You can send it through to us and we'll pass it on for you. Um, but I think that, I think that this chopper, boy could be significant if somebody can remember stuff about that he might not have anything to say he might he might not have any recollection of seeing john and gary that day it might just be that's that's that but it will be ticked off the list you know that's one thing avenue that they're not going to have to keep going down if that boy's found and his evidence is like well there isn't any then at least that's one thing they can cross off and start looking somewhere else i think it would be nice because this is, I mean, this was a brutal, a brutal murder. And the person that killed them is still free. As far as we know, that person is still or has been free and hasn't been prosecuted for that murder. 
or for both those murders, I should say. So I think it would be good for the families to be able to, they've said in lots, there's lots of interviews, you can look online, there's lots of interviews with the family. They're very vocal about trying to find the person that did this and trying to get justice. And I think for them, it would bring a form of closure. I don't think it would, it's not going to make things better, but I think it would bring some sort of end because they live this constantly all the time. It's always the unknown and not knowing what happened that I think they live daily. And I think it would be, you know, really good if we can help in some way. God, these cases are, these are frustrating ones, right? They are. I mean, we're talking like 41 years ago. Man, I don't know. Um, I don't see, I don't know what I think. I still don't know what I think. No, it's difficult because I go around in circles. You, you, you wonder if this guy, this John Cheeseman is the guy that, I mean, he obviously Herbert saw somebody up there and the person that he saw is almost certainly the person that hurt the boys because from where he walked minutes later to where that guy was stood hitting something, you've got two boys with with really, really bad, extensive head damage. So yeah, he saw that. So we know that he saw the person that killed them. Whether that person was John Cheeseman is another thing. And the fact that the police... See, I think that the police have messed this up for themselves because they've, they've interviewed him so much without a, a, a representative there. They've almost shot yeah. themselves in the foot because they've ruined it for themselves. Because now that other professionals are looking in and saying well nothing's on file from what you said to him before you took that statement so you could have fed him all the information and he's just recited it all back to you and now it's gone to court and they've what makes it so hard yeah exactly and of course it's gone to court and the defense have had an absolute field day with it because they've pointed out all the wrong things that the police have done so you've kind of just shot yourself in the foot with that and obviously the police have since apologized to the families but it's like a little bit too late you know it's it's too late for that now mm-hmm. i'm looking at some of the um pictures from the time yeah. um like when they're kind of searching the area yeah and it's definitely not what i expect it's different from what I, I had pictured in my in my head okay so it's it's um because it's there it's it's not like just piles and piles of like rubbish or you know discarded items uh-huh. it's like kind of within it's like these hill. I don't know if you call them hills, yeah. mounds, yeah. but it's like it's like grassland that has yeah. trash in there. Yeah. So I don't know. Is it different? Is I it could, like our tip different to your kind of tip then? Um. Yeah, I think I would say so. Okay. It's almost like because, like, looking at it, it almost looks like it's just kind of like. Like if you were to have like an illegal dump site, you know, yeah, Yeah. there's no like rhyme or reason to it. No, I think it's like I think that it is it is where everything it was a council waste like a waste dump. So normally it would be like it would be piled high with with normal rubbish. But I think looking back there, I think it's more like you can see it. It's more like well, the grass kind of it kind of grows. They let what they normally do is you let have like the, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You just let it go. And then it's sort of like, you start getting the, the grass growing up through it. So I think it's just where people go and dump stuff like, like old bicycles, bits of car parts and stuff like that. So I think that, I think that that's, you know, that's what it looks like. Um, and you yeah, can see, you can see where he's like walked down where they've, there's lots of things online where you can see the little um, map of where they've walked from John's house across the where the car park which is now something else um and they've gone mm-hmm. onto the wasteland basically it's just like like rubble wasteland yeah and yeah you can see a lot of pictures online of the mum if you look at the liverpool echo there's loads on there but there's pictures of the mums um and there's lots of videos of them being interviewed and that kind of stuff so i could have given you so much more interview but there's the main details are still the same yeah. You know. So w- while the boys were f- found alive, mm-hmm. they were n- they never had no. consciousness. I don't believe so. No, I think they were obviously in a lot of pain, and they. Oh yes, yeah. They they I don't think they could give any. I don't think they could give any information about what happened. So, but they did. I think they're. I think if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, I do believe that they're buried next to each other. 
I think their graves are right next door to each oh, other. Nice. And the mums, Alma and um, Barbara, remained very, very close from that point, from, from losing the boys. They, they did stay very, very close. So, um, yeah, I do believe that they were, they were both there. And Gary's dad, Ronald, was buried with his son as well. So after he passed away in 2000, I think it was 2005, I think he died, and he was buried with his son as well. So, yeah, crazy, isn't it? It's really sad. It's really sad, yeah. And it is, it's actually quite a sad picture. I'll um, save that for you to show you. It's quite a sad picture seeing the two graves right next to each other and thinking that's two 11-year-old boys. Cheeky little, you'd see the pictures of them. They're cheeky little faces. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine them sort of, if that was the case, you can imagine them being little scallions and like swearing at somebody and, you know, flicking the Vs up to them and stuff and being a bit naughty. But Oh, and I can think of like when I was 10, 11 years old, Mm. when I was 10, 11 years old, I could, I would be doing the same things they were, right? I'd be going out to the, to the, you know, into the, the dump and yeah. exploring and seeing what we can find and seeing what you know going out Such there and finding bottle. stuff that breaks oh yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. i remember once when i was a kid my brother and i um i used to there used to be like this clay it's almost like a clay chalk um cliff near where we lived and i remember once i was there and i said to my brother like look out make sure if anyone comes um tell me that someone's there and i was there trying to dig out this stuff because we used to make like little figurines out of the chalk that we used to dig out of the cliff and there had been a cliff fall and it was a sign saying that you weren't allowed in there and I remember going in once digging I said to my brother like let me know so he was calling me and I was calling me and I was like hang on hang on I won't be a minute and then I turned around there's a man behind me and he looked at me and said what are you doing I said to my brother you should have told me someone was coming he was like I did I kept saying I kept calling you And I remember getting in trouble for going and digging the cliff out when there was like a cliff fall. <laughs> my mum went crazy. Oh, but yeah. God. So hopefully somebody will be hearing, maybe someone will hear this podcast and know of somebody in that area. And maybe hopefully whatever Mark has uncovered will be a big help to the families too, and a big help to the investigation. Yep, absolutely. And that is this week's case. So let us know what you think on our socials. And if you are contacting us, it's best not through Facebook because we don't normally get the Facebook Messenger notifications that often. So if you're going to contact us, either do it via like email on our website or pop us an Insta message because there's more chance that we'll see Insta messages than we will Facebook. Yep. We're not old school anymore, so we'll, we're down with the kids using <laughs> Insta instead. <laughs> that is right. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, how about we lighten this week's episode up with a little dumb criminal? Let's do it. Hey, use a dummy and use a piece of shit. Plagiarizing the captain's voice there. (laughs) Thank you, Captain. All right, Cherry. So it is now Christmas time. Getting ready for Christmas coming up here shortly. And so a lot of people are going to be having, you know, packages delivered to their house. So got to be ever vigilant about porch pirates, right? Porch pirates, I love that. Okay, yeah. Well, for one porch pi- uh, pirate, he was arrested after wearing the exact same shirt the very next day to a South Carolina courtroom that he had worn to steal package- packages from people's porches. Oh, no. Oh, God, so, why? So a series of events began after a picture of a man in a green and a green red North Face shirt was posted to the Goose Creek resident group on Facebook by somebody claiming that he had stolen packages that had been left on his porch in the neighborhood. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, so the very next day, the accused porch pirate had a court date. And when he went to court, they discovered that this was the exact same man that had been stealing <laughs> items. <laughs> that is brilliant. from houses. That is absolutely brilliant. So he ended up going, yeah, going to courtroom the next day, and mm. he was arrested for stealing packages off of people's porches. So oh, if you're God. going to be a porch pirate, make sure you change your shirt. Well, either that. Or because it's Christmas, dress like Santa. 
because no yeah. one's going to catch you. At least you're going to be inconspicuous. Uh -huh. And then you go to court dressed in normal clothes because yeah. no one's going to accuse you of being Santa if you've got a white beard on. <laughs> oh That's crazy. What a silly sod. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. So apparently, yeah, he had a he had a, a court date the following day, right? Yeah. After this post was made. Yeah. For so an thinks, unrelated, oh. uh, unrelated, unrelated issue. And of yeah. course, this Goose, Goose Creek is a small, small area, right? So mm. as soon as he walked in the courtroom, the police <laughs> who had seen the post and yeah. was aware of, of this post saw him just strolling right on in. Well, there and he they is. made the rest. Walked in and handed himself in without knowing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant i love it the uh, dumb criminals get better they get better every week i, I can't yeah. believe we've almost filled a year's worth of episodes and we've had a dumb criminal for every single episode we need it's to work ridiculous. on our our bathroom book our dumb criminal bathroom book we should we should so do that i'm gonna start Maybe collating them together oh, oh god Maybe that's what we do. We plan that for next Christmas. So next Christmas, as a you know yes. stocking stuffer, you we can have Crimepedia's dumb criminal bathroom book. Let's do that. That would be so much fun. Let's do that. Definitely. Let us know if you want one, and we'll do them to like print to order. So let us know if you want a dumb criminal. Oh my god! Toilet so book. <laughs> you can read <laughs> while you're having a wee. <laughs> uh, just don't so be dumb when you're doing criminal stuff. People. Well, no, do it because it gives us material for our show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so carry on, people, doing the stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so we will be back next week with another episode, and it'll be Morgan's episode next time. So thank you for joining us once again and listening to us ramble on, and we will see you next week. So for now, be nice. And bye. <laughs>